can you believe this? We have two more philosophers to go, right? So we've looked at a whole bunch uh, of different philosophers, both classical, liberal, and also classical conservative. And today we're going to talk about, um, economically speaking, the most important classical liberal philosopher, and that, of course, being our friend Adam Smith. All right, so let's get down to the nitty-gritty here. So, um, Adam Smith. So again, guys, I mentioned that uh, Adam Smith is considered to be uh, one of the most important, if not the most important, economically classical liberal philosophers, right? So guys, again, Smith wasn't so worried about politics, right? He wasn't worried about governmental systems. What he was worried about was economics, right? That idea of, you know, uh, those three economic questions, what to make, how to make it, and then how to, to distribute it to the people, right? He was worried about that. So anyways, guys, Adam Smith, uh, he's a Scotsman, uh, and he's been called the father of capitalism, okay? And um, this guy, uh, he is synonymous with this idea known as laissez-faire, and you absolutely need to know what laissez-faire is all about. It is synonymous with capitalism, right? And laissez-faire, guys, is a French word that basically means let it do, let it go, let it pass, let it be. Basically, it just means leave it alone, right? Leave it alone, don't touch it, uh, and it will be fine. So what we're referring to here, guys, is this idea of hands-off government. When it comes to the economy, the government should be external from it, right? They shouldn't be controlling it, regulating, uh, making rules, passing laws that hinder the functioning of a free economy. So laissez-faire, guys, is this theory that there's these natural laws that um, regulate an economy. And really, guys, um, if it's not the government that regulates the economy, then what is it, Mr. Crosby? Well, let me answer that question for you, young folks. Uh, it is the invisible hand. So it is the invisible hand. And this idea, guys, of the invisible hand, um, we're going to encounter it again when we look at sort of the central pillars of capitalism. So it's not the government's hand that's in the cookie jar, taking, redistributing, doing all those things that we associate with government commonly today, but instead it's an invisible hand. And really, guys, the invisible hand is, uh, it operates using supply and demand. Right? It operates using supply and demand. And we know, guys, or at least hopefully you know in grade 12, you know, supply and demand is this uh, market force which is used to help determine pricing and availability uh, of goods and services. So this is Adam Smith, uh, another very famous powdered wig uh, of history. And he said, the best economy is a free economy. Now, let me explain this a little bit. So, guys, uh, Adam Smith, he wrote this book called The Wealth of Nations. The wealth of nations, right? You'll want to know that book here in Social 30, okay? So the wealth of nations, what is that all about? So guys, basically what Smith asked is how come some nations are wealthy and others are poor? So the uh, official title for Smith's book is actually, and I have it open here on my phone just to make sure I don't screw it up, it's an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. And we just generally call it the wealth of nations. And guys, in this book, again, Smith asks, why are some nations rich? Why are others poor? And what he observed, what he observed, what he saw was that it was the nations with the freest economies where people are allowed to pursue their self-interest, where the economy... Uh, is operating using this invisible hand idea, which he coins later. Um, it is these nations that have the most wealth. So are you saying, Mr. Crosby, that it seems like when people are working for themselves rather than working for the government or someone else, that they work harder and create more value? Yes, that's exactly what I am saying, guys. 
Capitalism is the most efficient mechanism we have in the creation of wealth, bar none, absolutely bar none, right? And what's the alternative? A controlled economy. Okay, well, socialism and communism. Uh, do we see the same kind of wealth in radically socialist states? The answer is no. What we see is a quality of poverty. All right, let's keep going here. Let's keep going. Okay, so there's his book there on the screen, The Wealth of Nations. Look, it's very, very conceivable that at the 30-1 level uh, for your three-source analysis, you are going to get a quote from The Wealth of Nations. I've seen them before, uh, and I mean, I don't know what's going to be on the future diploma exam for you, but it is very possible that you are going to see quotes from uh, The Wealth of Nations. And you should know that, oh yeah, okay, The Wealth of Nations, that was that book in 1776, the year it was published, uh, that Adam Smith wrote, right? And guys, 1776, speaking of world history, that's kind of an important year, right? 1776 was the year in which um, America had their revolution against King George of Great Britain. Um, so when the Americans were looking for an economic system to sort of model their nation after uh, or to embrace uh, as far as the way America was going to operate. Um, they looked to Smith and this new idea of laissez-faire capitalism and were like, that is what we want. And guys, I mean, today, who has the largest economy in the world? Do you know? The answer is the United States of America. So guys, there is something to be said for an economy where the people, which are sort of the operating agents of it, um, when they're free, they tend to produce more wealth. All right, so Smith argued uh, the free economy uh, and the free market of, again, this idea of supply and demand, right? Very, very important, um, should drive economies, not the government, right? Not the government, but supply and demand should drive economies. And the invisible hand of competition was the only regulation an economy needed. And again, guys, the invisible hand is uh, an unintended market force. It just happens, right? The invisible hand just happens. Again, it's not the government. It's just, you know, there's an invisible hand that sort of just guides the economy in the direction in which it needs to go. It's not government. It's just when rational actors like capitalists, like entrepreneurs, like people want to make money, pursue wealth, then they will do things that unintentionally make society better, right? So as I'm trying to get paid, I create a product or service that you get benefit from and you win because your needs or wants are satiated they're supplied and my need for money is also satiated so there's this symbiotic relationship there's this um sort of round and round that happens in the capitalist economy okay so guys uh whenever there was a demand for goods or services that should say services there my apologies um suppliers would compete with each other to meet that demand in order to make profit right that's just what supply and demand is and smith believed that capitalism was the path to human liberation. I want you guys to understand capitalism equals economic freedom. Right? Socialism, the opposite of capitalism, is economic control. So Smith believed that capitalism was the path to human liberation, to human freedom, right? You don't have a king, uh, a czar, uh, an emperor, or somebody telling you the job you have to do, how much your uh, labor is worth, all these kinds of things, right? That is determined by the market or the free market as it sometimes is called. So Smith argued that society gets better when we unleash our talents and abilities, right? Whatever those talents or abilities are, right? When the government um, doesn't meddle in it, then society gets better. So some quotes from our friend Adam Smith, right? And uh, I would argue the most important quote there, and in fact, we have seen this in the 30-1 three-source analysis, um, is this quote here it's not from the benevolence of the butcher the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner but from their regard 
to their own interest. So what he's saying is that, you know, uh, a butcher, they don't supply you meat because they love you. They supply you meat because they want to get paid, because they want to make sure they can provide for themselves. The brewer, the beer you drink at the end of the day, if you're over 18, right? The brewer who makes the beer that you drink, um, they're not doing it because they love you, right? They're doing it because they want to get paid. The baker, right? That bread that you eat with dinner. Again, they don't love you. They want to get paid, right? So they're focused solely on their own self-interest. They're figuring out what they can offer you a value that you will separate yourself from your hard-earned money from, right? Kind of a neat idea. So they're not doing it because they're benevolent or looking out for your own good, right? Looking out for other people. That's what benevolence is. When you're benevolent, you look out for other people. No, that's not the case, right? They do what they do because they want to get that money, period, point blank. That's it. Okay. Now they might get satisfaction from it. And um, as someone who owns a small business on top of what I do, um, I do get satisfaction from what I do. And the fact that I get paid to do it is kind of cool, right? So anyways, um, yeah, that quote, really, really important. Okay. That's Adam Smith, ladies and gentlemen. So yeah, he's kind of a big deal. Okay. Um, in the next one, we're going to talk about the anti-Adam Smith, and we're going to talk about Karl Marx, okay, and the father of communism. These two economic ideologies we're leaving to the end, which are basically in uh, opposition to one another, okay? So anyways, as always, I love you guys. Peace, and we'll see you in the next video.